engineering. Uh, all good. Uh, so I'm a sophomore studying industrial engineering with a minor in econ and business. Uh, and I'm a leader in the Hindu youth community at Penn State. Uh, so I, I'm happy to speak to you guys today about Hinduism and its uh, universal appeal. Um, as I was putting this presentation together, I realized that I actually had to study a good amount more uh, to gain a deeper understanding so I can explain uh, some of these concepts of Hinduism. Um, and yeah, so Hinduism, really, it's sort of a natural religion, uh, meaning that its philosophies and principles are considered universally accessible um, with study, uh, practice, uh, and experience in addition to revelation. Um, and Hinduism is also an indigenous uh, religion uh, with a large, a very large family of philosophies and traditions uh, that have been practiced throughout Asia for thousands of years. Um, and I'm gonna take you through some of the key concepts in Hinduism, uh, as well as some misconceptions um, and talk about some of the festivals uh, in Hinduism and uh, how we celebrate hin Hinduism at uh, Penn State. Um, and so I hope that this presentation gives you uh, a deeper understanding um, an appreciation of, you know, the ph philosophy, practices, universalism, and spirituality that Hinduism brings. Uh, and I'm going to try and explain it to the best of my ability. Um, so thank you. So, um, so Hinduism is, uh, is known as uh, Sanatana Dharma, uh, and it's also the oldest religion in the world. So Hindus themselves actually didn't uh, coined the term Hindu. Um, it was given by uh, the Persians. Uh, when they came to India, they saw uh, uh, people practicing a diverse group of philosophies, uh, and they called the people Hindus. Uh, and the British sort of took up that name, and ever since then, uh, the word Hinduism has stuck. Uh, but Hindus uh, originally referred to their religion as Sanatan Dharma. Uh, and Sanatan means sort of eternal, and Dharma is a complex word. Um, but it's sort of way of life is one way to describe it or, uh, truth or, uh, righteousness. Uh, so that's, it's, there's many sort of definitions for Dharma, but Hindus originally referred to their religion as, uh, Sanatana Dharma. Um, so, um, so many of you, uh, may, uh, believe that Hinduism may be quite different. Um, but I'm sure some of you are familiar with some concepts and uh, terminology. So I'm just going to give you maybe like 30 seconds or a minute. And why don't you guys uh, tell me how many terms you recognize over here? Yeah, so I know we're on Zoom, but does anybody want to say how many terms uh, they think they know from here or I've heard of? I don't know yes. that I know them, but I've heard of at least 10. Seven, okay. 10, wow, okay. Yeah, yeah, so that's that's good. So, um, can we switch back to this? Yeah. yeah, so that's good. So, wow, so 10 terms, seven terms, okay. That's that's good. So, um, yeah, so um, I'm sure everybody's familiar with karma. Uh, maybe people have obviously heard of yoga. Uh, I'm sure everybody's heard of om, uh, namaste. Uh, and you know, with the new Avatar series, I'm sure, to, sure a lot of people are hearing about the term Avatar. Uh, but hopefully by uh, the end of this presentation, for those of you who don't know, uh, you'll be more familiar with some of these terms. Uh, and yeah.
So um, I want to talk about starting this off. I want to talk about some key concepts in uh, Hinduism. Um, and then after that, uh, I'll just talk about some misconceptions and um, uh, other aspects of Hinduism, such as the festivals and how we celebrate it. So starting with some of the key concepts, um, we start with reincarnation and karma. Uh, then I'll cover nature of the soul, uh, nature of God in the world, uh, the different deities and gods, uh, what is avatar and what is alila, uh, what is the aim of life according to Hinduism, uh, what is moksha, uh, what is yoga, uh, gurus and saints, and then also some sacred uh, texts uh, and scripture within Hinduism. Uh, so starting off with reincarnation and karma, um, we believe that uh, the body is temporary and we believe that the soul inhabits the body, but after um, we die, the soul will go to another uh, body. So it will transmigrate. Uh, so you're, so ultimately your soul is eternal, but your body is temporary. Uh, but we sort of call reincarnation this sort of painful cycle because it's constantly continuing. So we call it samsara. Um, and karma really is... Uh, I'm sure everybody's heard of karma, but, you know, you do good actions, you get good things in the end. Uh, you do bad actions, you may get bad things now or in the future or in your next life. So karma, uh, karma is that, just that. Uh, and people sometimes believe that in Hinduism, uh, we want to just get positive karma. But that's actually the first step in Hinduism. There's a larger process. So we, we want to escape the cycle of uh, reincarnation. Uh, and that's done by actually getting rid of all our previous karmas, because karma is what ties us to this cycle. Um, and in Hinduism, um, there's many conceptions about the world, but we say that all living creatures have souls, so animals, plants, uh, insects as well. So we could potentially be born as any one of those uh, creatures, but human life is sort of uh, viewed as sort of special because we sort of have that independence and free will uh, and ability to realize God. So Hindu human life is viewed as really, really precious in Hinduism uh, and sort of a golden opportunity um, for, for us. Uh, but we, in the end, for Hindus, we believe that we want to escape that cycle of reincarnation and sort of get rid of the karma that uh, binds us to it. So, yeah. And then, uh, now this slide is a complex uh, topic um, and I'm gonna try and explain it to the best of my ability. Uh, I actually had to do a good amount of research on this slide so I could understand it. Um, so if anything doesn't come out as clear, uh, feel free to ask me or um, ask now or in the end. Um, so, and hint, and so I think that asking yourselves, you know, who am I, I think it's a fundamental question. Um, and a lot of, uh, this has been pondered by many people, uh, across the world for millennia. So for example, um, at the temple of Delphi in Greece, in ancient Greece, uh, the words are inscribed, know thyself. So it's a really fundamental question, not just Hindus have asked, but you know, people all across the world have pondered and really thought about. Um, but in, in Hinduism, uh, we believe that, you know, we're, we're not the body itself. The body is temporary, uh, but we're that eternal soul. Um, and that soul is the source of our consciousness. It's a non-material um, aspect, but it inhabits our body, which leads to consciousness and life. And the soul is eternal. Nothing can change it. Uh, nothing can destroy it. Nothing can um, burn it or whatever. The soul is just eternal. So our body, our body dies and then it gets either buried or burned. But that doesn't happen to our soul. And that soul is a part of God. So the soul in Hinduism is called the Atman. And it's the source of consciousness. And it's viewed as a little part of the Paramatman or Brahman, which is the um, God without form. So you may ask, um, 
know, why don't we have godly powers right now? Uh, if we're a part of God, um, how does that make sense? Um, and why are we separate from God or why do we perceive ourselves to be separate? Um, and the answer to that is because we're under this thing called Maya or material energy. Um, and that's, be, that's, that's makes us associate ourselves with the body and forget our true nature uh, and think we're separate from God. Uh, and so that, that sort of Maya brings ignorance and turns us away. So the goal of Hinduism is really to realize that oneness with, with yourself and God and really know yourself. Um, and, and the Vedas is a scripture in Hinduism. Uh, one of the statements uh, is, is Aham Brahmasmi or I'm a small, I'm, I'm part, I am God or I'm a part of God. Uh, so that's just one of the statements that we believe. And we believe uh, God is, you know, all pure bliss, uh, no form, no gender uh, in the really deep sense. Um, and in reality, there's nothing apart from it. But because we're under that material energy, we perceive ourselves to be separate uh, from that truth. Uh, and that nature of existence, once we realize that highest state, is called Satchit Ananda, which means truth, consciousness, and bliss. So. Uh, so um, this is a pretty important question. And it's also sometimes a misconception uh, that people have about Hinduism. So many people sometimes view us as uh, polytheistic. Uh, some people say monotheism. Uh, so the truth is that in Hinduism, uh, we believe in one God, but that one God, is, which is formless, can also take uh, a multiplicity of forms. Uh, and you can worship uh, that one God in any of the forms that you like or relate to. So you can worship him as, for example, Vishnu, Shiva, the mother God, uh, the energy. Um, and Hinduism is also pluralistic. So it accepts uh, you worshiping God uh, that other religions would do. Uh, so other gods from other religions are also acceptable and considered you know, manifestations of that one uh, true God. Um, and um, in Hinduism, uh, although God is genderless, um, sometimes the forms appear to have a gender, but in reality, God is beyond that. Um, and we say, you know, the female manifestations of God are sort of the energy and the male manifestations are the energetic. Um, and and the Vedas, it says that God is he who has created the world. He pervades it. He's not affected by it. And he's all knowing. Uh, um, so, yeah, that's sort of uh, a description of God in Hinduism. Um, and we believe we can relate to it in many different ways. So there's many experiences of the divine. Uh, so, for example, um, I'm taking linear algebra right now, and I may learn something in one uh, particular way, um, while someone else may learn it in another way. Um, so in Hinduism, it's sort of that pluralistic approach in which in the same way you're learning something, we all have different capabilities. We all, uh, some things may help us more than others. The same way you learn math or you learn any other subject. Uh, in Hinduism, you approach God. Uh, you can approach the same one God in uh, many different ways, and they're all considered um, acceptable. Um, so, yeah, it's a multiple sizes fits all approach rather than a one size fits all approach. Um, so, um, yeah, moving on to that. Um, sort of getting into some of the deities and gods in Hinduism. Um, um, we, so the, uh, I have a mouse right here. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Um, so this, um, is, this is called Brahman, which is the unmanifest form of God. Again, we, we in Hinduism believe God to be one, but he can take on different forms. 
to show his different aspects. Um, so that one God can manifest into Vishnu, can manifest into Shiva. Uh, and this is uh, Vishnu's energy. She's depicted as Lakshmi. Um, and these different gods, although they're one, have different aspects. You could take it from that lens. In Hinduism, uh, there's also a tradition that places Vishnu as supreme. Uh, and he's viewed as sort of the same as the Brahman. But he manifests into these different gods. And some of these goddesses are his energy, so to speak. Uh, and another tradition in Hinduism views Shiva as sort of the supreme god and him as the Brahman and the source of all manifestations. So you can choose one god or many gods to worship based on what you uh, like and relate to. Or you can choose to worship a formless god. So it, it doesn't really matter in Hinduism. Uh, and yeah, whatever way you relate to the divine, uh, um, Hinduism would accept it. Um, and, uh, so many people may ask, how do you choose like what God you relate to? Or, uh, it's just based on what you feel most connected to. Do you feel connected to Vishnu? Do you feel connected to the mother goddess? Uh, what aspect or personality of God do you feel uh, connected to? Um, now, moving on, uh, this is a pretty important concept in Hinduism. The, the two concepts I want to touch on in this slide. Um, so there's a concept of avatar, and there's also the concept of Mila. And avatar means that God incarnates here on earth. Uh, and can be in various forms. Um, so on the top left, you see Ram, uh, considered an avatar of God. And on the uh, top right, you can see Krishna, uh, an avatar of God or God himself. Um, and they, God comes down to this world and takes forms, uh, take, comes down to this world. So you may ask, why does God do this? Um, and, you know, what is the purpose of this? So and we believe that it's for many reasons, but the main reason is that, you know, God takes avatar to guide us, uh, inspire us, uh, protect his devotees, uh, annihilate a dharma or evil or wickedness, and, and also do something called lilas uh, and teach us uh, many things. Uh, and sort of getting into what a lila is, um, Alila means divine play. Um, and it's basically uh, God puts on a play. Um, and it allows us to have relationships with him uh, in which we can see his full glory manifest. So um, in Hinduism, we believe that we can have differing relationships with God. So we can view him as a uh, friend, uh, hero, beloved father he could be our father he could be our mother and we can view him as our son so god takes these forms uh and puts on these lilas so we can relate to him uh more readily in a variety of different forms uh we can experience his divine pastimes and build intimate connections with him after seeing his relationships in the world so to sort of uh, give you guys an analogy um this may seem like a foreign concept, but I'm sure uh, many of you are familiar with Christianity. Um, and Jesus uh, and Christianity is viewed as the same as God. He came down to the world, right? So he could be classified as sort of the same as an avatar, right? And the personality of God becomes real through the personality of... Um, okay. I think it's two sides down. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. And in Christianity, um, so uh, Jesus came down. Uh, he's the same as God, but he came down to this world and so, sort of similar to the concept of an avatar, where the, his personality, the personality of God became real through the personality of Christ. 
And that's a similar sort of analogy to how Hindus uh, view uh, God. So God comes down, uh, his personality, his leelas uh, become real. It's something that we can, uh, you know, see his full glory manifest um, and also uh, have divine relationships with him, right? Because he can come down and, uh, and relate to us in many different ways. Um, so um, in the Ram Avatar, so sort of to give you guys a brief uh, discussion about this, uh, Ram, who is God, uh, none other than God, but he incarnates on the world uh, for many different reasons. One of them is to establish Dharma. Um, and in this, in this avatar, he lives as a normal human, but his actions show us how we should live life. And he goes through multiple hardships uh, that many normal people wouldn't even go through. Um, and in his leelas, he's separated from his wife. He's exiled from his kingdom. His wife is kidnapped, uh, actually, in, in the epic. Um, and Ram shows us how we can live even when beset by many difficulties, uh, miseries. And he also shows us his full glory, his relationships with the devotees, you know, his divine qualities of kindness. Uh, and we can see uh, his full glory manifest through these different lilas and experiences in which he guides us as well. Um, and so rather than having a book say, you know, God is uh, merciful and kind, um, Krishna coming down to the world, showing his kindness and mercy is better for us to sort of grasp how, how God, how great God is or some of his qualities. So that's, um, that's sort of another reason for the concept of Leela and Avatar. Um, yeah. And there are many different Leelas uh, and relationships that Krishna has, uh, you know, as he's a child, he's, uh, you know, playing tricks, uh, but he's at the same time uh, tricks on his mother, on on the other gopis, the people in the in the land in which he's born, uh, and so that's a relationship of God being sort of a son to us, in which we can love him. Uh, he also is shown in many lilas as dancing with the different gopis, uh, uh, and that's a relationship of him being a lover. Uh, that's why he's frequently depicted having a flute. Uh, you know, he's carrying that around. He's dancing. So although this may seem different, it's just God relating to us on different levels that we can. Uh, and Krishna, I'll show you another picture on the next slide. Um, over here, Krishna is relating to the cowherd boys in which he's born with as a friend. Um, and this is just a quote from the uh, Bhagavad Gita. Uh, sort of showing that. And over here, and uh, another one of his leelas, he's showing his divine powers and the battlefield in the Mahabharata. So God comes down for many different purposes. Uh, and yeah, so that's the concept of avatar and leela. Uh, I hope I explained that well. Um, I know it's sort of a tough concept to grasp, but I hope I did my best. Uh, so moving on, um, in Hinduism, we say that there is, um, that we uh, define life as having uh, four pillars or aims. So uh, it starts with Dharma. Um, and Dharma is really um, sort of, it's, it's a tough word to describe because in English, it doesn't have one direct transliteration. Um, but it has multiple meanings. So uh, sometimes you could say it means uh, doing your duty, uh, the truth, uh, righteousness, and moral values. Uh, so sort of like leading uh, a good life in harmony with natural laws uh, defined by scriptures and uh, examples that God gives in his avatar, uh, and also your own judgment. So dharma is a core thing. Uh, that Hindus try to incorporate uh, all the time throughout their life. Uh, it's a core concept. Uh, we have material dharma and spiritual uh, dharma, and it's and it's subtle. So we're not just following laws in a book. So uh, in Krishna's avatar, he gives an example of 
um, why Dharma is complex. So for example, um, he gave the example of one time a man who vowed not to lie, right? Because lying is viewed as bad. But thieves asked him, okay, where's somebody else's money? And he didn't lie. So he told them where the money was and the thieves stole from the other person. So Dharma uh, is not always following uh, direct rules from books. It can be complex. Sometimes you may have to break it, break uh, certain principles, but it's for the overall righteousness of uh, human life. And it's a complex thing. Uh, so you sort of make your own judgment on that. And you have the examples of the avatars of God to sort of guide you on what is Dharma and what is Adharma. Um, and again, Artha is another goal in Hinduism. So sort of trying to secure yourself economically and also better your community. Um, but that has to be anchored in Dharma. Like you can't get money from stealing or doing illicit uh, things. It has to be anchored in Dharma. Uh, and Kama is also another uh, goal of human life to you know, have pleasure, progeny, um, and companionship. And then the final goal is moksha or uh, liberation. Uh, and moksha really is um, finding unity with the supreme being or God, uh, freeing yourself from that cycle of birth and rebirth um, and losing your ego and gaining realization of the divine self. So that's sort of moksha and that's the final goal of uh, life in Hinduism that we should sort of strive to. Um, so just talking more about uh, moksha. Um, so in this diagram, we see, you know, we're born, we have life, we die. The cycle is continuing and we're, bond we're bonded by our karmas. But moksha really allows us an escape uh, and attain true liberation. Um, I'm sure many of you have heard of the concept of nirvana in Buddhism. Uh, moksha is similar, but it's not exactly the same thing. Uh, nirvana in Buddhism is, um, is sort of um, trying to stop worldly desires and escape that cycle. But in Hinduism, it's um, it's more so turning those world, worldly desires to desire for the all pure God. And that allows you to escape the cycle. Um, and moksha depends on also the uh, divine grace of God and becoming one with him uh, in Hinduism. Uh, so pretty much you have to, uh, and the way to attain moksha is through uh, paths known as yogas in Hinduism. Um, and what you end up doing is that you detach yourself uh, from the materiality of existence uh, and sort of attain oneness, uh, the divine bliss, bliss uh, that transcends um, all understanding, materialness, um, find reality and unity with the supreme uh, being. So... I hope that sort of explained uh, the concept of uh, moksha to you guys. And if you guys have any questions, uh, feel, feel free to ask. Uh, yeah, huge. It's like no one's. Sorry. Yeah, so, yeah, sounds good. Um, and so the way to attain moksha is uh, described uh, in the Bhagavad Gita, um, where Krishna shows um, Arjuna four paths to attain uh, uh, moksha or liberation. Um, again, this is a very uh, detailed topic, uh, and I'm going to try and sum it up uh, in a short description, uh, but this is not the full complexity of the topic. And uh, so if you guys are curious in the end, uh, 
definitely do ask questions or uh, look, I, I have some links that you can look at um, to help better uh, uh, explain some of these concepts. So uh, these paths aren't mutually exclusive, uh, but there are different ways in which we can achieve liberation or moksha. So starting with uh, karma yoga, um, this means pretty much is the path of selfless action. So you do your dharma, your duty, or the rightiest thing, uh, and you have no attachment to the rewards or your efforts, and you try and dedicate yourself uh, as acting as an instrument of God uh, and doing things for God's pleasure. Again, this is sort of a simplified description, uh, but we try, as Hindus, we try and practice this in our daily lives. You know, you don't do this for myself. I'm doing my duty as a service to God. And with that sort of attitude, you don't accumulate any karmas and you burn your previous karmas. Um, and God sort of takes care of you and liberates you in the end. Um, so this, so again, Hinduism, we don't believe to shun uh, your duty, but continue doing your duty, but as a service uh, to God. So that's sort of the main message of karma yoga. Again, somewhat simplified, uh, but um, sort of a, it's kind of a summation of it. Uh, and the second approach is called uh, two different names, uh, dhyana or raja yoga. Um, this is sort of the path of uh, meditation, um, controlling your body and mind. Uh, once you, and you do this, so you attain that uh, state of oneness um, with uh, God. Uh, and that's through, uh, can be through intense practices as well. Um, jnana yoga is the <clears throat> third path. So it's the path of self-inquiry or knowledge. Um, and you sort of study the scriptures um, and you find, uh, you ask yourself, you ponder, you ask yourself questions um, to sort of figure out the truth. And you get to it. Uh, when you realize, when you truly realize that divine knowledge. Um, and in the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna describes all of these paths, but he recommends the path of Bhakti Yoga, which is the path of uh, selfless devotion, uh, loving devotion and surrender to God. Um, um, so pretty much you try and love God uh, with all your heart. Uh, you pray to him, uh, Think of him, surrender to him fully, uh, and he takes care of you from there, uh, and you lead, you become liberated. So it's sort of the easiest, consider the easiest and the 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 best path within Hinduism, uh, the path of bhakti yoga. Uh, jnana yoga is a very difficult path, so is dhyana yoga, uh, but bhakti yoga is something that everybody uh, can do uh, in in Hinduism. Uh, so, and these paths aren't mutually exclusive. You know, you can practice jnana yoga and bhakti yoga. You can do karma yoga and bhakti yoga. You can do any one of these paths or choose one. Um, but it's just really based on your preference. So it's as, uh, it's what you make of it, right? So there's no one way to do, to approach things. You just do it in whatever way suits you. And you can rely on, the scriptures or different saints uh, and teachers to sort of guide you uh, and help you uh, cultivate these different paths. Um, and uh, so sort of going to what yoga is, I mentioned the four yogas over there, uh, which lead to moksha, but um Yoga itself means union, so union with God. Um, and yoga has eight limbs. Um, I know many people think of yoga just as, you know, doing like asanas and that's, uh, and even um, pranayama, which is breathing. Um, but uh, yoga also has a spiritual dimension. So there's many different dimensions of yoga. And ultimately, that sort of leads you um, 
uh, that's sort of part of the Raja Yoga, leading you to um, sort of Samadhi or spiritual enlightenment. Uh, so there's also a spiritual aspect to it as well, uh, described in the Bhagavad Gita and also um, sort of some of these asanas and the uh, postures were described by a sage or rishi Patanjali uh, some 2000 years back and forms the basis of, you know, modern yoga as we see, see it. Um, so um, touching on the gurus or saints. So in Hinduism, um, any human, anybody can realize uh, God and attain that divine state uh, of oneness. And these people sort of live in the world. They're people just like us, but they've attained that supreme state of consciousness. Um, and they, they sort of teach us and guide us. Uh, and they sort of help us. Uh, they teach us different philosophies. Um, they show us uh, their devotion uh, and devotional works and help uh, help us reach that liberation. Um, and saints isn't exclusive to one group of people. It's for all people, uh, women, men, uh, rich, poor, um, anybody and everybody in Hinduism uh, can become uh, saints. Uh, so it's for all people. Um, there's, there's no divisions. God doesn't care about whether we're rich or poor or male or we're female. He doesn't care if we're young or we're old. So, uh, this is a picture of a saint called Andal. She's, uh, actually attained that state as a young child. Uh, so this is how she's depicted. Uh, she composed a lot of devotional works in uh, the Southern region of India. Uh, this is <clears throat> Mirabai. She's sort of a devotional saint, um, a great devotee of Lord Krishna um, and sort of famous around the Western India region, uh, sort of in the 14th or so century. This is Tulsi Das. He wrote the Ramayana, uh, infused it with devotion, uh, but he wrote it in the common language of the people in Northern India at the time, which was Hindi. Um, and he also composed many devotional works about Lord Ram. This is a recent saint, uh, Ramana Maharshi. Uh, he's referred to as Bhagavan or God. Um, and he conveyed uh, the knowledge of Jnana Yoga um, to attain God through his silence. Um, so this is uh, some more recent phenomenon. Um, and yeah, he sort of led a lot of people. Uh, this is Adi Shankaracharya, um, sort of a famous uh, saint in Hinduism who really uh, reestablished a philosophy at the time when people were decaying, they were falling into ritualism. He really reestablished Hinduism uh, throughout and spread the true mess, uh, the the truth within Hinduism because at the time people were, you know, resorting to ritualism and some practices that are not the true meaning of it, but he really sort of reestablished that and sort of helped convey philosophical basis um, and also created many devotional works within Hinduism. Um, now, moving on to the last concept that I want to touch, um, in many religions, you have um, sort of one scripture, um, whether the Bible, the Torah, the Quran, um, but in Hinduism, it's somewhat different um, in which there are a multiplicity of scriptures um, and it's sort of subdivided into two sections. So the first section is called the Vedas, uh, which means knowledge. Um, and it's sort of direct revelations uh, and it's considered to be the knowledge of all time. Uh, and it's a direct revelation from God. And these different scriptures are classified as Smriti. Um, the Vedas are subdivided into four categories uh, and each Veda, each of these four Vedas is subdivided into four categories. Uh, it's not really too important to know the distinction uh, between them. It's a pretty complex uh, subject, but uh, the Upanishads are sort of the crown jewel of the Vedas, which really details deep uh, philosophy. Um, itihasas are um, recorded 
historical accounts. Um, and there are accounts that they're not just stories. Uh, Hindus believe them to be history and what, you know, we're familiar with. Uh, and we integrate the teachings from these um, epics into our daily lives. So there are two of them. Uh, the first one is known as the Rama, Ramayana, Ramayana, and the second one is the Mahabharata. Um, the Ramayana is 24,000 verses. Uh, the Mahabharata is about 100,000 verses, uh, and it's the longest historical epic and poem in the world. Uh, the Ramayana details the story of Lord Ram, who's considered God or avatar of God. Um, he comes down to this world uh, for different purposes. Uh, and as I've mentioned before, um, he, he grows up. However, his stepmother exiles him from the kingdom. Um, his wife gets kidnapped and he sort of faces, he, he inspires his devotees. He leads his life as a human uh, while showing godly qualities and showing us how to live in many different situations. Uh, and this is just a picture of him defeating the evil sort of king that kidnapped his wife and was doing a dharma or wickedness in the world. Uh, and Ram, after defeating him, returns from Lanka uh, back and establishes dharma through the land. Hey, hey. Um, the hey, Mahab. Hey. Uh, What's the Hindu program that's going on in Horse Park? Horse Park? Uh, uh, anyone have a question? How are you? How are you? Uh, so, sort of the second epic, it's um, it contains many different um, uh, stories within it uh, that sort of teach us. Um, uh, there are many different stories within the Mahabharata, but the it's uh, going to be very hard for me to summarize this and. Uh, just just a minute, but sort of the the whole essence of it in just a minute. But um, sort of the um, it's sort of a a one set of cousins dispossesses another set of cousins from their kingdom, uh, and Krishna, our God, leads the Pandavas, the righteous cousins, towards uh victory and the war that ensues after the cousins dispossess them, uh, send them to exile. Um, and it's really deep philosophy. Um, and from this, we learn a lot. There's so many stories that we learn. Um, just to bring an example of, you know, my life and, you know, what I, I, I learned. So there's so many stories. Uh, this uh, warrior there on the, um, on the, on the right, uh, Arjuna, um, sort of viewed as the greatest archer of all time. Um, one story that I, I've thought about some particularly frequently just even today was um, uh, as he was a young, so him and his cousins, they were prin princes and in a kingdom. So they got instruction when they were growing up on warfare and uh, other things like that from a teacher. And in one of those stories, the teacher asks them, uh, he puts a wooden bird on a tree, right? And he, he brings each of the cousin, cousins up as he's teaching archery. And he asks them, you know, tell me what you see over here. And, you know, so one of the cousins and even his brothers, they say, okay, I see the tree. I see uh, the sky. I see you. And then he tells them to sit down. You won't be able to shoot it, shoot the bird. And then he asks Arjuna, what do you see? Arjuna says, I see only the eye of the bird. He asks him, do you see me? Do you see the bird? Do you see the tree? He says, no, I only see the eye. And he says, okay, shoot it. And Arjuna shoots directly to the eye. But this story has deep, much more deep meaning because if you want to achieve something in life, you have to be focused on the goal. You can't let external things distract you. You have to be very focused. Um, and these are just many of the... Uh, uh, learnings that we get from these different stories or leelas from the two the two uh, scriptures. Um, the Bhagavad Gita is uh, sort of the flagship scripture of Hinduism. 
uh, takes place on the Mahabharata. Uh, Arjuna, Arjuna is uh, uh, plagued by doubt, and his uh, his friend and God, Krishna, guides him on righteous conduct, duty, and attaining realization. So it's a summation of all the Upanishads and Vedas. Um, and Krishna instructs Arjuna on the path to uh, liberation. It's uh, one of the most, uh, it encompasses all of Hindu spirituality in just 700 verses. Um, and it's really quoted throughout Hindu households um, all around uh, the world. So um, just one quote um, from the Bhagavad Gita. There's many quotes that Hindus, uh, you know, think about in their daily lives. Um, one quote is, uh, your obligation is to the action, never to its fruits. Do not be motivated by the fruit of your actions, uh, but do not become attached to non-action either. Um, another quote is, those whose mind is in control and who's free from likes and dislikes attains tranquility in mind, even though they're interacting with the world, with senses, engaged among the objects. So a lot of these uh, verses Hindus uh, recite and chant and they think about uh, the meaning behind it um, and yeah so it's a pretty uh, common scripture that Hindus uh, detail uh, Puranas are sort of uh, there's 18 of these Puranas uh, they're devotional literature describing uh, different gods uh, their avatars uh, their pastimes or leelas an interaction with their devotees uh, and these are really um really devotional uh going through many not a lot of different knowledge knowledge on you know the creation of the universe uh philosophy uh knowledge on worship among others uh, these are just two of leelas of krishna um in the puranas um and sort of talking about uh contributions that hindus made in the past um, a lot of people don't know this and a lot of it is overlooked for a variety of reasons, mainly due to colonialism. Um, so a lot of people don't know about some of the contributions that Hindus have done in the past, but some of the first, the first university in the world was created in Takshila, 700 BC, uh, and again, this list could be extensive. I'm just detailing some of them. Uh, the concept of zero, the decimal system, uh, area of a triangle, uh, trigonometry, tri trigonometry, among others. Uh, the concept of the solar system, uh, the gravity as a force between the Earth, uh, the concept of 365 days in a year for astronomy, uh, this concept uh, aspects of surgery and vaccines that you see practiced here. Uh, and these are from some of the Hindu gurus that sort of uh, delved into this knowledge uh, to try and understand the scientific phenomenon. In the ancient world, uh, there's also architectural uh, contributions as well, as you can see from the many temples, uh, arts contribution in literature, uh, in the Sanskrit language uh, with the various poems and hymns, as well as uh, arts uh, and classical dance and uh, medicine such as Ayurveda, uh, among others. Uh, and this is the last part of my presentation, uh, but I wanted to touch on some uh, common uh, questions of um, Hinduism uh, that many people seem to have uh, and sort of uh, dispel some of the misconceptions. So Hinduism uh, itself doesn't call for, uh, doesn't re require all its followers to be vegetarian, but it does support, it does recommend uh, the choice of being vegetarian to its followers, but it's really a choice. Um, but that's for three reasons, because we believe that we all have uh, soul, us and animals, and we want to cause the minimum pain as possible to other creatures, uh, which is called ahimsa or nonviolence. Um, and food uh, from animals 
uh, is considered somewhat harmful spiritually. Um, but Hindus who eat meat may eat from eat uh, creatures with lower intelligence or lower emotional intelligence, such as fish, rather than creatures that are more similar to humans, such as cows or uh, other higher order creatures. Um, so pretty much you eat food according to your availability um, and uh, try and integrate that perspective in Hinduism. Um, there are specific reasons for cows. Um, so many people, uh, so the word uh, sacred cow in Hinduism has short, uh, in, in English is sometimes uh, used as a metaphor for superstition. Um, but there's a deeper meaning behind why Hindus uh, don't eat beef in particular out of other meats. Um, and the reason is that, you know, in the West, people don't eat, uh, in the West as well, people don't eat certain animals. Uh, so in the West, we don't eat insects or we don't eat dogs, right? And we don't eat dogs, dogs because we view them, dogs are sort of viewed as a symbol, right? A symbol of friendship, uh, that they're man's best friend. And in the Hindu culture, uh, cows are the ones who give us milk, right? And who gives us milk? Our mother gives us milk. So cows are sort of viewed as a symbol for motherhood. So because of that symbolism, Hindus uh, don't eat beef uh, in particular. Um, so um, a lot of uh, people somehow uh, sometimes view that Hinduism uh, calls for a caste uh, system, but that's actually not true. Um, in none of the Hindu scriptures do they say that there is a caste system or anything based on birth. Um, what really happened is there's two separate, um, just to check if these are questions. Uh, there's, there's two separate things, uh, Varna and Jati. So Varna refers to job and that is sort of based on your abilities, um, and your actions. So it's not at all based on birth. Jatis were different tribes or different groups of people. And at times they gravitated towards certain Varnas, um, throughout society, but it was a fluid system. Um, and Hinduism itself doesn't say that people, sh if you're, you should do this job based on your birth. It doesn't call for that at all. Uh, and you can see from the Bhagavad Gita, um, it says that, you know, your virtues, your qualities, your actions are what determine your Varna. But what happened was that around the 17th and 18th century, the British sort of came into India and they saw this system and they saw that it was a pretty convenient system to sort of exploit people. So they conflated the two categories and sort of created the caste system as we see today. But the caste system itself is not a concept in Hinduism. Uh, Hinduism views all uh, humans as equal. Uh, again, we all have soul uh, and we're all a part of God. So we're all equal. Uh, and our Varna is determined by our abilities, not our birth in Hinduism. So um, this is just a picture of what happened in the past with the British sort of grouping different groups of people uh, based on birth uh, into certain castes and sort of conflating the two. Um, and this is a quote from the Bhagavad Gita that says that, you know, all people are equal. Um, but I wanted to bring up a phenomena um, that sort of come into play in um, the modern day, especially in the U.S. Um, a lot, a lot of um, in the recent years, there's uh, people that have been seeking to add caste as a category, um, and this may have some. This is I, some. A lot of Hindus view this as. Uh, entrenching the caste system and in somewhere where it doesn't need to be because no Hindus want to identify themselves with their caste. So adding caste as a category uh, really just divides 
Hindus, it divides South Asians, and nobody wants to be identified with caste. So it, so it has a bit of, um, a lot of Hindus view it as having a bit of Hindu phobia uh, associated with some of this legislation, because we don't want to be identified with our caste and we don't want it to be a legal part of any system. We just want to be identified as Hindus or Americans. Uh, and caste is not Hinduism, right? So it's important to keep in mind that uh, anti-caste legislation uh, may actually be uh, used by certain people um, not for the greatest purposes, although it may seem like a good idea. Um, and again, that's been a topic that's come up recently, but I wanted to help educate people on why that's the case, because we don't want you know, communities of color to be divided, further divided legally based on caste. Uh, we want us to all be viewed as equal. Um, and yeah, so um, having, having said that, it may cause racial profiling as well, as well as bullying of, you know, Hindu students uh, in schools when sort of caste is conflated with Hinduism uh, itself. But that's, caste is not the same as Hinduism. Uh, in fact, some of the most uh, uh, greatest uh, people who have changed and criticized this have come from the Hindu community uh, themselves. So it has nothing to do with Hinduism. Um, sort of getting into another um, misconception about Hinduism. Um, again, the, I'm sure many of you have heard of the swastika. And I do want to acknowledge that, you know, what happened with uh, the Jewish people in Nazi Germany, uh, obviously the symbol um, means a lot to them. But um, for centuries, the, this was, uh, the Nazis sort of took this swastika uh, that was used by Hindus, Buddhists, Jains, other Eastern religions, and they twisted it to this um, and called it the Hagen Cruz. Uh, so it's two different symbols. I, I want to say that it in Hinduism, this is the swastika. This is not the swastika. Um, and the Nazis sort of distorted the sim original meaning of the symbol um, to the swastika that Hindus and Buddhists and other Eastern religions view it as. Um, and this is the correct swastika. So I want to draw a distinction uh, between the two and acknowledge uh, some of the history. Um, um, so a lot of people sometimes uh, say that Hindus worship idols or they're idolaters. Um, and this is not actually true. Hindus don't worship statues, believing them to be God but believe that the statues and images are physical representations of God that you can focus on during prayer and meditation. So we're not worshiping statues. Um, and we're just focusing on an aspect of God from the statues uh, and that th they help us um, gain, uh, connect with God in different ways, but we're not worshiping the statues itself. Um, and I want to say that all religions have symbols. Um, in Buddhism, you have Buddhas. In Christianity, you have crosses, uh, pictures of Jesus. And you have uh, Om for Hinduism, Star of David for Judaism, a cross for Christianity, and a crescent moon for Islam. So Hindus don't worship idols. Uh, they use idols as um, a, they view the statues as physical representations that allow you to focus on God during prayer and meditation. And symbolism is common in all religions, um, not just Hinduism. Uh, but yeah, um, going into some of the last slides of the presentation, uh, this is uh, described as called Bharat um, in the Hindu scriptures, sort of uh, the Holy Land where a lot of the avatars Leelas and saints were born in uh, corresponds to about South Asia. 
a lot of people view Hinduism as an ethnic religion, but that's actually not true. Uh, Hindus don't proselytize, but um, it's not an ethnic religion as well. And in the past, it was spread in Southeast Asia. It was the majority religion in Southeast Asia as well. Uh, but that's not the case now uh, due to some historical incidents. incidents. Um, but in the past, it was widespread across South and Southeast Asia. But Hinduism itself is not an ethnic religion. Uh, um, sort of touching on Hindus at Penn State. Uh, you know, the Hindu community is uh, large at Penn State. It's about a thousand people or so, I would say. Um, and, you know, we celebrate a lot of Hindu festivals um, and it's a lot of fun. So if any of you are free, definitely come out um, and celebrate with us. This is, uh, these are pictures of Holi at uh, Penn State. This is just actually outside the business building in which it was done. Um, sort of the festival of spring and love. Um, so it's a lot of great fun. Um, so definitely, uh, there's, we also hold, hold uh, Diwali and uh, Navaratri uh, at Penn State as well. So it's a lot of fun. Anybody can come out, all people, all uh, groups of people, religions, everybody can come out, have fun uh, and celebrate. Uh, that's all what it's, that's what it's all about. Um, so there are many Hindu festivals um, such as these. Um, it's going to take a lot of time. This is not all of the Hindu festivals, but it's some of the major Hindu festivals. Uh, this is just a picture of uh, Diwali. Uh, this is a picture of Shivaratri, uh, the prayer to Shiva, Ram Navmi. Um, when Ram was born, sort of celebrating that. This is Rocky. Uh, where you tie bracelets of protection around your siblings. Um, this is uh, Ram Navmi as well. This is uh, uh, Diwali, celebrated with a lot of um, dance. I know there's vibrant color, uh, lots of food, uh, sweets as well. Uh, there's social mingling as well as dances and prayers and songs throughout the night, throughout a variety of these festivals. This is Krishna Jayanti talking about the birth of Krishna. This is uh, Diwali as well, the festival of lights. Um, and this is Shivaratri, sort of a more uh, deep uh, meditative uh, 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 holy day. Um, uh, again, there are so many Hindu temples. Uh, the subject is vast and complex. This is uh, the Meenakshi temple in Tamil Nadu. This is the Sri Rangam Temple in Tamil Nadu. This is the Ram Mandir. And this is actually the Angkor Wat in Cambodia. Uh, so there are so many Hindu temples across the world, it would be hard to describe all of them. But these are some of examples of Hindu architecture. Uh, these are from thousands of years ago in the past. And this is from just recent. So, um, yeah. So sort of ending this off, um, we want to talk about interfaith relations. Um, you know, Hinduism, we believe that there's many different ways to attain God. We uh, accept uh, people praying to other gods as well. So there's plurality. Uh, it calls for respect for all. And the Vedas, the Holy Scripture in Hinduism, calls for creating a world based on the philosophy of Vasudeva Kutumbakam, which means that the world is one family. So that's sort of what we strive to achieve and believe. And this is sort of a prayer from the Vedas. Uh, it goes, Om Sarve Bhavantu Sukhinaha, Sarve Santu Naramaya, Sarve Bhadrani Pashchantu, Ma Kashtat Dukbhag Bhaveta. So may all be become happy, may all be free from illness, may all see uh, auspiciousness, may no one suffer. Om, may, may there be peace for all. Uh, and that's sort of uh, what we strive to achieve, uh, creating respect, uh, really living this philosophy of uh, peace, tolerance, and harmony. Uh, and yeah, uh, that's sort of uh, what we believe in Hinduism, uh, sort of took you through some of those concepts. Um, hopefully you guys are uh, familiar with more of these terms now uh, from the start, or 
if you were already familiar with them, that's great. Um, and these are just, uh, this is just a site for you to look at some uh, other basics in Hinduism. So yeah, that concludes my presentation. Thank you guys so much for uh, showing up and allowing, allowing me to explain my faith um, and the complexity of Hinduism. It's a really complex subject. I had to do a lot of research on this and I'm glad uh, you guys came and sort of uh, were able to listen. Thank you so much. We have some above us saying uh, thank you. And this was a really great um, presentation. And yeah, thank you for coming. And I hope that we'll be able to speak with you again right. um, about Hinduism as well. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, thank you for the Pasquarela Spiritual Center for hosting this. It's a really great series. Yeah, thank you so much.